During the past years, uh, writer Ted Chiang has, like few others, invited us through his short stories and his novellas to think language beyond the linearity in which we know it, the temporal and the physical linearity of human language, and to think um, language also beyond the human. Um, some of you may be familiar with Story of Your Life, um, which was um, at the inception of Arrival, a mainstream film in which we had this octopi-like creatures who were communicating with, with humans in circular form. Um, and after writing Story of Your Life, um, some years ago in 2015, Ted Chiang collaborated with a duo of artists, um, Allora and Calzadilla, in uh, writing um, a story called Great Silence, um, in which is, again, imagining um, lang lang human language as a limit for our relation with with other beings and with other animal beings. And so we're very honored to have Ted Shang here with us. And we're going to, um, before his presentation, we're going to screen uh, a Loren Casadillas uh, video. And then we're going to host Ted Shang. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <coughs> so, uh, whenever I think about the topic of uh, interspecies communication, I um, always think of uh, this famous quote from uh, Wittgenstein. He said that uh, if a lion could speak, uh, we could not understand him. And uh, while a lot of philosophers debate what exactly uh, he meant by that, um, I think that it, it, it's noteworthy that um, he didn't say Lions are speaking, and we don't understand them. He seemed to uh, acknowledge that uh, what lions are doing is not language. It is not the, it is not the type of meaning making that we are engaged in when we use language. Uh, and you know, this is not to, uh, uh, so, from my perspective, I don't uh, wish to uh, diminish the uh, significance of the type of communication that animals engage in. Um, but I think it is uh, instructive to uh, think about some of the differences between animal communication and language uh, that, as, as humans use it. Um, Back in the 1960s, the linguist uh, Charles Hockett, he noted a bunch of about 16 different, uh, what he called language universals, uh, or traits that, uh, properties that human language had, which um, he thought were unique to human language. Uh, and while some forms of animal communication may possess like one or two of them, uh, no, no form of animal communication possessed uh, a, even a majority of them. And um, one of them was a property called uh, displacement. And, uh, to, and this, is, this refers to the ability to uh, reference something that isn't actually present. Uh, and, you know, one way to understand this is that, so um, there's a species of, of monkey, uh, vervet monkeys. They have uh, different warning calls depending on the type of predator that's nearby. So they have a different warning call if they see an eagle, and if they see a leopard, or if they see a snake. And so the other monkeys, depending on what type of call they hear, they, they react accordingly, because uh, what you're gonna do when there's a, a leopard nearby is different than what you're gonna do if there's a snake nearby. And so you know, this, is, this is, I think, you know, a very interesting use of uh, I mean, a very interesting example of animal communication because they clearly have, you know, they're clearly using uh, their sounds to convey something meaningful. Um, 
But, on the, but one thing that they don't have is uh, displacement. They can't talk about lions, or they, can't, they can talk, cannot talk about leopards in the absence of leopards. Um, you know, they can't sit around and say, you know, what about that leopard yesterday? <laughs> um, and they, and they, nor can they say, you know, what should we do if we see a leopard tomorrow? Um, and you know, that is something that only, as far as we know, only humans can do. Uh, and I think, you know, um, you know the, that is one of the, that, that, that is one of the th things to, you know, think about as to, you know, uh, what distinguishes language from uh, other forms of, of animal communication. Um, and again, you know, this is not, uh, this is not to say that uh, language is the only uh, useful form of communication. Uh, humans engage in plenty of non-linguistic communication. Um, in many contexts, uh, some would say that most of our communication is occurring through a non-linguistic channel. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of things which cannot be done through a non-linguistic channel. And you know, those are things that you need language for. And you know, they, uh, a lot of those involve you know, more abstract topics. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm, I, I sometimes, you know, uh, I've, I've sometimes been asked, you know, like, well, what about, you know, this, you know, such and such form of communication, you know, do, do you think, does that, is that a language? Or, you know, like, what about this? Is this language? And I guess, you know, and my reaction is usually, well, could we have this conversation in that mode? Um, and, you know, so there are a lot of, you know, forms of communication, you know, uh, music, dance, uh, art, uh, all of those are powerful forms of communication. But um, we can't really have this specific conversation without using language. Um, and so, you know, uh, that, you know, that I think is worth, worth noting. It's worth thinking about, uh, about um, you know, what is it about, what can we do as language users that we cannot do when we don't use language or that you know, species that don't possess language, you know, you know, what can we do that they cannot? Um, and so uh, if we, uh, then if we sort of turn to the, the topic of you know, possibility of communication with uh, extraterrestrial intelligences. Uh, you know, the, the SETI program has, in the past, uh, has mostly uh, relied on um, uh, mathematics as the basis for uh, establishing communication with an alien species. Uh, there was an astronomer named uh, Hans Freudenthal who actually uh, developed an entire book-length uh, uh, program, a, a book like syllabus of uh, a way to build up uh, a vocabulary um, and uh, using strictly radio signals uh, and mathematics was the basis for, uh, for establishing that, uh, uh, that communication. Start, it's, his system started with simple mathematical concepts and then worked his worked the way up his way up to more uh, complex ones, and um, and the, you know the reason a lot of astronomers uh, uh, have uh, have gone to mathematics as uh, the basis for attempting interspecies communication is because you know they they often say mathematics is universal, and. Um, uh, I, I once, uh, but I, I once had a discussion with uh, the cognitive scientist Rafael Nunez. He um, he said mathematics is not universal. There are plenty of human cultures which don't have any words for numbers beyond three. So, you know, if they get along fine without mathematics, you know, mathematics is, is not universal. Um, and you, uh, you know, obviously, you know, he's correct that you know, a lot of cultures they get get by just fine um, without uh, what we consider mathematics. 
Um, but of course, you know, when it comes to communicating with uh, an extraterrestrial intelligence, our options are very limited. You know, uh, it, the channels are very narrow. There will, uh, like, we'll either be communicating with them through radio waves, or you know, uh, they would have to come here and talk to us face to face. If we went there and talked face to face, then essentially, you know, um, the situation is comparable to trying to communicate with non-human intelligences right here on Earth. But um, uh, so what distinguishes the, the, the scenarios that are different are communicating with someone via radio waves or if they come here. Um, and you know, both of those scenarios involve high technology. And uh, uh, high technology probably does require mathematics. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I do believe that, you know, anyone who is going to build a radio telescope will converge on certain ideas about, you know, like what the value of pi is. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think that you're going to be able to build a working spaceship um, unless you, uh, you know, have some of the same mathematical concepts that we have arrived at. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, I do think that mathematics is universal. But again, you know, that it has to do with, you know, uh, because you know, I think, you know, math is the same all over the universe, but uh, as a basis for technology, it only works, I mean, it, it's only relevant for, um, it's only useful as a, for communicating with a, uh, a technological species through you know these sort of these channels that I've mentioned, either radio communication or face to face, and you know of course then you know that raises the question that you know who are you leaving out when you reduce when you limit yourself to those channels? Because um, you know you can certainly imagine an intelligent species which never bothers to build a radio telescope, uh, which never has no interest in building a spacecraft to come visit us. Um, you know that is not engaged in, you know, maybe uh, the, the creation of a, you know, high technology civilization uh, in the same way that we are. Um, so, you know, uh, those are, those are, um, uh, those are people who, you know, by necessity, you know, are, we are, we're sort of, uh, Ignoring when we talk about you know w w with traditional SETI approaches because because um, yeah un unless until we can build a ship to get there you know um, they're simply they are simply not uh, not a candidate uh, we are you know we're really limited in the possible candidates that we you know could establish communication with because of um, uh, you know. What is available to us, and likewise, you know, um, cognitively, what we, you know, what are we going to recognize as intelligent? Um, so, you know, so in, if we, you know, we can certainly imagine a alien species that doesn't build radio telescopes, but engages in, in a lot of other activities that we would recognize as intelligent. They just happen to not have that one, and so, yes, they're not going to be a candidate for uh, a SETI. Um, and then, you know, like, so then if you sort of consider the question more broadly, you know, uh, what are the other possible forms of, uh, what things would, you know, could a species engage in that we would think it are intelligent even though they, you know, do not resemble you know, our own goals, our own, uh, uh, the, the particular path that we have followed. Um, and, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I have always, you know, been drawn to this idea of a, um, a powerful, intelligent alien species that we really find incomprehensible. Um, 
One of my favorite depictions of an alien uh, encounter in science fiction is from a um, novel, uh, a 1977 novel by John Barley called The Ophiuchi Hotline. And um, uh, in the scenario of the novel, um, uh, aliens have, uh, aliens have basically destroyed uh, all of life on Earth, but they did it without intending to. Um, because they actually came to our solar system to talk to the inhabitants of Jupiter, uh, which we don't really recognize, um, and sort of as a, you know, sort of as a, uh, uh, just a good Samaritan deed while they were here, they, um, they wanted to protect the cetaceans of Earth because they sort of see they sort of classify uh, life in the universe in three categories. Intelligent species like them, who inhabit gas giants. Then there's cetaceans, who you know, are okay. And then there's everybody else. And so by their standards, humans and termites are basically, you know, they all fall in the same category. And uh, so they destroy all of human technology um, just as basically a cetacean protection measure. Um, and, and other than that, they ignore humans completely. Uh, and you know, because th uh, there are humans elsewhere on, in the solar system at, at this point, but the aliens you know, ignore them entirely because you know, the human infestation on those planets don't, uh, uh, don't pose any threat to cetaceans. It's just actually literally humans on Earth that uh, are destroyed. And um, so yeah, that, is, that has always been one of my favorite depictions of a, uh, of a powerful alien intelligence. Um, you know, I, uh, you, know, you know, there are, there are, there are these issues with that, that depiction, you know, if you sort of look at it closely, um, because like these aliens, when they kind of came to visit our solar system, how did they travel here? Do their ships resemble anything ours, like our, our ships? You know, if so, you know, wouldn't they see some similarity between you know, the ships we build and the ships that they travel in? You know, um, uh, and you know, the, no the novel you know, also has to sort of hedge on the question of like, how did he humans even know what these aliens were doing? Um, uh, because you know they obviously made no attempt to communicate with us, and you know so uh, uh, the uh, the ways that the, the humans actually you know learn this about uh, the aliens you know is uh, uh, to some extent it's sort of hand waved. Um, so you know there, so All that, all that to say that you know, while while this is you know my favorite depiction of alien intelligences, you know, I recognize that there are these um, these questions uh, about it. If you if you try and like examine it really closely from a sort of hard-headed, uh, rational perspective, um, and you know, I uh, I, I guess you know. I, so I, I, I personally, you know, have always felt this tension because, like, in, in a lot of respects, I would say that I'm a hard-headed rationalist, and um, you know, these questions about, like, you know, what does it mean to say that some somebody, a species, is intelligent if there's no possibility of us, you know, understanding them? Is that a useful definition of intelligence? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, because, you know, even, you know, when we, you know, the ways that, you know, you know, vervet monkeys warn each other about, you know, eagles or uh, leopards, you know, we recognize what, what's happening. You know, it, 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 you know, it makes sense to us in at least that, that respect. You know, is there something that could be alien, so alien and intelligent that, you know, we could not make any sense of it at all? Um, you know, I, uh, I don't, you know, the hard-headed you know, rationalist in me says, like, no, because, you know, in order for that phrase, for that, you know, for that concept, the, the term intelligence, for that to be, you know, useful as a term, 
you know, there have to be, you know, some things that we can kind of piece together about, you know, things that we can identify in, about it. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, the, uh, I have, I do, so I, I have to acknowledge that uh, this tension that as much as, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm very much drawn to the idea of a alien intelligence which is uh, you know, profoundly incomprehensible. Uh, but you know, I also have to, um, I also have to wonder, you know, you know, what does it mean to say that something is intelligent um, if, if we have, uh, have nothing in common with it, if we cannot make any sense out of what, what it's doing? So I'll, I'll uh, leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you.